Hi, I'm Mark Burris, and this is Straight Talk. John Saffron, welcome to Straight Talk. G'day, how are you? <laughs> I'm very good, thank you. Now, I I just want to know what that T-shirt is. I can see the menorah on your it was from your left hand side. So, what is that T-shirt? Oh, this top. It's uh, it's my my first ever exploration into what's the how am I pronouncing it? Haute couture or whatever. Where uh, I saw online this top, and it's uh, this these New York designers, and they've their father pay, played for this soccer team called Beitar Jerusalem, and so they designed a cool top like that, and. Uh, so I ordered it. It was quite cheap though because it was years after it was on 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 the runway. But I had to get new clothes because I, in the lead up to the release of my book Puff Piece, I bought all this cool Melbro merch that I thought I could wear for like the when I'm doing the photo shoot for the Age and the Guardian. <laughs> and so I I bet the farm on that, and then. Uh, yeah, the message got back that, no, that's breaking the advertising code. If we put papers in the newspaper of you wearing uh, Melbro logos. So, yeah, that was a bit of a bummer. So I, I went on Q&A and I just had to wear my old normie clothes. The most disappointing thing was that uh, after I handed in the manuscript to this book, for this book, to Penguin, and there was a few months before the book's release and so... I did. I went on a big like health kick. Lost a lot of weight. A lot of weight. A lot of weight. So I was no longer like jowly and everything. And uh, but then when they couldn't run the photos, when the age couldn't run the photos of me because I was wearing the Melbro logo, so I had to run with a file photo of me where I had where I had my former fat face. So even though. The review was very good of my book. I was imagining my enemies reading it in the paper that morning and not getting to the article, like not reading that it was a complimentary article and just, oh, my God, look at, look at his fat face. And I just wanted to, no, it's not, it's not fair. I don't have the fat face anymore. I lost all that weight. And that's why I have this top. I want to, I want, I'm really uh, intrigued by John Saffron and I, I wonder if you could – because you're the best person in the world to do this, I think. Um, could you describe who you think John Saffron is today? Uh, the person or the artiste? It gets confusing because in my book, I am a character in my book. And it is me, but it's obviously an edited version of me. But not, no, not, no, for any enemies, not because I'm like trying to be tricky or hide things or anything like that. It's because I'm trying to be entertaining and funny and stuff. So, Unlike my enemies who just go on and on and don't know how to edit themselves, I'm like, oh, I'll just put in the bit of me that's entertaining. And uh, so so that that's why book me might be different to the real me, but it's not really different. It's just like an edited down version of me. So I, I try to I try to think of, of what what's fun and what's what's bits of me that are that are interesting and what what are dynamics I can have with other people that are interesting. Yeah, that's what ends up in the book. I think the sincere bit of me is that I am very curious. I'm I'm a limit I'm a very limited workaholic where when I become fascinated with something and I'm curious, I go really hard. But then I'm like a lazy workaholic. I'm either like a very lazy workaholic or a very hard working lazy person. I don't know which one. Where, yeah, so in, in a very narrow sense, I, I go so hard and I work as hard as, you know, like a, a regular hardworking person, which is because you can't fake putting out a book. There's like, and you can't like do that on the last night. There's like, I think there's like 90,000 words in this book. So yeah, that, and that, that's why I'm actually glad that I have evidence that I've worked because I kind of forget that because if I didn't have my three books on the shelf, I'd be like, I didn't do any work, but this, how could I have not done any work if I have those three books on my shelf? So hang on, does that, I, I feel like I'm, the more I go on, the less I'm answering your, your question of who I am. So yeah, I'm a very curious person and I like exploring things and I get very stimulated and, and I feel like I'm making a contribution, uh, you know, in a very modest way. 
uh, by kind of going on these explorations and looking into things that other people aren't looking into. And I, I feel very satisfied when I find things or look at things in a way that hasn't been overdone before because I feel um, when I was growing up and I'd read books by outsider artists, I guess I guess maybe in a very vague sense I'll use that expression. When, like when I grew up I liked outsider artists and by that that's kind of like people who are a bit on the outside looking in but kind of on the inside as well of like a community or a society. So, so sometimes that's like a real edgy kind of out there fringe player, uh, you know, someone who's on like on the cutting edge of offensive rap music or something like that. But then, then other times it's something a bit more, you know, like Mad Magazine, for instance, when I grew up, or Monty Python, for instance, I'd say they're sort of like outsider artists in a way in that they're not quite the mainstream, but, you know, they're not blowing up buildings either. And, uh, yeah, it's a very vague term, outsider artist, because I guess, yeah, it could be like an author like Hunter S. Thompson could be a filmmaker like Spike Lee, could be, you know, could be a comedian, could be not a comedian, could be a musician, not a musician or whatever. And so then I'm, I'm like pretty happy when I realised I'd stumbled into that world and that's kind of what I am. I really try not to ruin that. by <laughs> So when I do something new, I try to be a good outsider artist for one more project. And when I've got to the end and I have succeeded in that, I'm going, phew, thank God. It's sometimes my creative work, I think, is the only thing I've got right in my life compared to like regular me outside my artistic world. So I'm very protective of, you know, things like not selling out, for instance. But I don't mean that in some way of like not getting money or not working for the man. Or I don't mean it like that. I just mean doing something that's sort of authentic and true and resonates as true and is emotionally true and is interesting and curious and Blah, 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 blah. You told us about John Saffron, the, the artist, the person who writes books, the person who performs, the person who entertains. Um, I, I get that. And I, I, I want to park for the moment who's John Saffron outside of that, um, you know, like day to day. And it could be a, it could be a, it could be a real boring jo- John Saffron. No, I think like, like for instance, in my, in Puff Piece, I like talk to my rabbi and that's in the book, talk to Father Bob, talk, and I talk really deep stuff with my father about, his upbringing and his parents escaping the Nazis and stuff. So it's like it's all blended in and it's all true. Like it's all these conversations I would have even if I wouldn't be writing a book, I guess. So, yeah, it's, it's not like it's not like the other me is just totally different. There was an article recently where the, the journo tried to make a real distinction, like John's very serious uh, when the – when the microphone's off and he goes home, he's a very, you know, tried, tried that angle, which is like, there's like, I can, maybe there's an element of that, but I don't think my friends would say, or my family would say, like, I'm really dark and serious, you know, if I think things aren't being recorded or anything like that. It's just a, it's a bit of a, a mess of the, of the, of the two things, but I'm definitely a better creative person than I am a person, I think. For instance, I try to have a lot of integrity <laughs> as a creative person and in my work in, in its own way. Like I'm very, whilst like I'm probably more dubious <laughs> like in my non-creative life, not in a bar, it's not like you're going to find some dead bodies like in my closet or anything like that or a, a head in the freezer or anything like that. <laughs> you use the word conversation and I always find that an interesting word for when it comes from a performer or an entertainer. One of the things I've I've noted about, and I do I do it myself, is that a lot of times when we're writing books or we're doing a TV show or we're being interviewed and we're talking, we're actually not actually having a conversation with uh, the other person. In other words, you're not really talking to me. Um, a lot of times we're just talking to ourselves. <laughs> do you ever experience that? I mean, do you find that John Saffron is talking to himself when he writes his book, he's actually talking to himself? Yeah, 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 certainly. But I, I feel like whilst I am having a conversation with myself, I do still have that extra layer of what's going to be stimulating or entertaining to the audience. Like I never do – I'm never – I don't think I'm ever not thinking about the audience in that it, – it, yeah, it's not like I have Tourette's and I'm just like, well, I have to say this. I have to talk about my family. I have to – because – even that's really edited in that, you know, I have like family members, for instance, that I don't talk about. I have friends I don't talk about. 
And that's just me making these kind of like subjective choices of oh, what's – and, you know, I have things I think about and are concerned about that I don't talk about and put in my book, and that's just me making these subjective choices about what's going to be stimulating and invigorating and entertaining for for an audience. So I, I don't think I ever I, – I don't think I like I lose myself when I'm writing a book, when I'm like – I. I lose myself from thinking about really, you know, I'm always thinking that. I actually feel as though I'm jumping into your brain and I'm following John Saffron <laughs> around as he wanders through the streets of his brain, the back alleys and front alleys. Yeah. And 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 I, that's what your books are sort of about to me, to me anyway, and, and, and that's your, what your entertainment is. It's, uh, I, hi, I'm John Saffron. Welcome to my brain <laughs> and let me take you up all the various alleys. I'm not going to take you down the main street. Because, you know, uh, I'm going to take you down all the side streets and just have a look at all these interesting shit that I've been thinking about every now and then and, and uh, exploring from time to time. All of those things that you're talking about have all culminated into this most recent, your most recent piece, Puff Piece. Do you think that Puff Piece is one of the more important things that you've done? I think it's the first thing I've done where I decided uh, for a couple of reasons. I decided I'm really going to spell out what my – point of view is and why I'm doing this and really hold the reader's hand. So there's no like, there's less reading, there's no really reading between the lines in this book. And I would have thought that's when I was younger, <laughs> one book ago, um, I would have thought that's uh, artistically not the way to go because surely the good thing is letting readers read between the lines or whatever. But I, be, because this was uh, a topic that, like people didn't know about because it's about a new a new kind of shenanigans in the uh, cigarette industry. And then on top of that, because I didn't know about it because it's got to do with things like science, which what do I know? I, and, and, and also because I, did, I didn't want anyone, I didn't want to give any space for people who don't like me to kind of misinterpret this or – because I've had that in the past where like people who kind of want don't like what you're saying – they act all cute, like, oh, I don't know. Oh, John seems to think, you know, like they try to act all cute. And I was, I was really annoyed with that a bit of the reaction from my last book because of that, like things where it was like, read between the lines, you know what I'm getting at. And then people taking advantage of that. Not too many people. I'm, I sound like I'm bitter and twisted. But I, I, so I made a conscious effort with this book to uh, just be very kind of ha- have that thread through it where you know exactly what I'm getting at. Yeah, exactly why I'm interested and what I'm out to try to do, and I, and I really think that made it a a a, a better book, I think. And I I, I guess it, it's also because I'm, I'm talking about an issue that hasn't been covered by is like a, like a journalist could do what I did in this book in a total straight way, and it would be valid, and and that sort of runs through it because it is it's it's covering thing that's been unco- that just hasn't been written about uh, before. Yeah, and it's important because it's about it's about it's about public health. It's about people dying of cancer. It's about people not being aware of that they might be t- taking something that's going to kill them. And so, yeah, it is, I guess it is. Um, it's important in that way. Instead of me following you around all the back streets of uh, John Saffron's <laughs> brain, all of a sudden you've grabbed me by the hand and you're taking me to exactly yep. where you want me to see what you want me to see. I've always been jealous of this uh, UK writer, and I actually know him, so I guess he's sort of a friend or whatever, uh, John Ronson, and he writes these books. He wrote a book called So You've Been Publicly Shamed and The Men Who Scared Stared at Goats and Them, and he's done a few other things. And he's really good at having a theme that's really compelling and really connecting to like all a universal theme and then sort of soldering onto it the most awesome example of that theme and whilst my books for instance like my first book murder in mississippi like it's about a murder in mississippi and and there's all this idiosyncratic kind of subtext to it and and you know what i mean but i don't it, it doesn't have that over that bigger theme which the murder was attached to or whatever and even in my last book about extremists there was a lot of more of like it's about extremists and and there's lots of idiosyncratic and funny and ironic and blah, blah, blah subtext, but it's not that big theme above it. So then when I started exploring this issue and I realised, oh, my God, I can make this a book about like 
the, the power of words and how you can really bend history and the universe and the future to your favor, you know, like in a dangerous way, just by like doing all these like word substitutions and be, be, and so it's so it's even more extreme than just say oh language is very powerful or rhetoric is powerful or marketing is powerful is like if you manage to relabel things you like the world's your oyster and so so in the case of Philip Morris the Melbro people um cigarettes banned menthol cigarettes banned across Europe oh okay fine we'll just rename this cigarette a heat stick and we'll re- rename air, a smoke aerosol. We'll rename tar this or that. And it's like worked in the most high stakes way possible. It's like uh, there was, it was the beginning of the end for Philip Morris because uh, Europe was banning cigarettes and tar is seen as deadly. And, and what they've done, they've come in and just changed the language around things and it's worked. It's like menthol cigarettes last year were banned all across Europe, but menthol heat sticks which are cigarettes just rename heat sticks they're they're allowed in and i just thought oh my god i've done that thing that my that guy i like john ronson does where i've got a i've got a theme about the power of language and the power of words and the power of relabeling things and then i've come up with the most this real like high stakes dynamic example to tell that story which is uh philip morris and uh you know they're their fight to stay alive. Um, just explain to me, how the hell did you actually think sitting down one day that you're going to write this? Why is it this back alley you decided to take us down? Well, uh, every year the World Health Organization has a no tobacco day because they're against cancer. And then uh, a couple of no tobacco days ago, Philip Morris, the Melbourne people, took out full page ads in the newspaper saying that they're going to shut down as a cigarette company and relaunches a health enterprise trying to get the world's one billion smokers, including their own customers, off cigarettes. I was like, what? So that seemed like really, wow. That seemed like, goddamn, this is like the fall of the Berlin Wall or the end of apartheid. Uh, if, if this is true, is this like the end of cigarettes? And because uh, cigarettes, uh, like 52 million people die of everything, each year, and out of that, eight million are cigarette related. So it would be amazing if Philip Morris, the world's largest cigarette company, the Melbourne people, were actually shutting down. I thought, oh, maybe they are. And but then I started uh, digging around, snooping around a bit, and I I realised that you can't take what the makers of Melbourne cigarettes say on face value all the time. And yes, and and what they were doing is they were. <laughs> introducing a cigarette which they claimed wasn't a cigarette and they just reworded it a heat stick and a heat stick is tobacco rolled in paper with a filter at one end that you plant between your lips inhaling nicotine and tobacco into your lungs and exhaling this thing that kind of looks a lot like smoke and which if you dig around um, dig deeper enough they do admit in their papers contains smoke toxicants but they say it's not technically speaking smoke, so it's not technically speaking a cigarette. And the reason they had to do all this thing is because uh, the European Parliament was banning menthol cigarettes with a mind to ban all cigarettes across Europe. So this would have been the end of, or the beginning of the end for Philip Morris. And this is the way they got around it was by manipulating the English language and just and just seeing how, like, if you. If you if you evaporate the meaning from words, and uh, even when they're as consequential as this thing is going to give you cancer, and so, so so, but if you kind of like evaporate, like this isn't a cigarette, it's a heat stick. This isn't smoke, it's aerosol. This isn't tar, it's nicotine uh, free dry particulate matter. All through these like word games, they manage to stay alive to uh, keep their people from not staying alive so uh, and 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 so there was that whole thing i i was just confused why no one was covering this like philip morris figuring out uh how to snap victory from the jaws of defeat by uh coming up with this new story to tell and this new angle that was going to keep them alive when they were actually going to be that they could have ended this could have been the end of them 
And so then I started being interested why no one was interested. And so the book explores that, like what it says to us about a society that on the one hand, people are so moralistic these days and so judgy and finger wagging. So it's not like there's, it's not like we're living through a moment where everyone's like, hey man, do what you want, man. It's not like that at all. Everyone's like wagging their fingers about everything, but somehow Philip Morris don't get the fingers wagged at them. But it was psyching me out because I was thinking, hang on, if no one else is doing this story, does that mean it's not a story? Obviously, Philip Morris, they must have known about this for some time. It, uh, and when you say they snapped, they got uh, snapped victory out of the jaws of defeat, um, it wasn't like it, was, it wasn't a quick tactical thing. They just went whack and we're sweet. And they must have been working on this for a hell of a long time because it's not just something you would go to bed at night and wake up in the morning at 3 a.m. and say, no, there's a, there, now there, there's a way around this. And tomorrow morning I'm going to get my team together and I'm going to announce it and we're going to announce it to the – to the world and uh, and and will probably take a week to develop this thing, um, these heat sticks um, and all the as you say all the the language around it um, and all the cute ways around it. Do you think that these organisations like Philip Morris are in cahoots with government or in cahoots with uh, the WHO? I mean, because you know, I don't know. Today, all the conspiracy theories exist around the WHO and yeah. COVID and all that shit. You know, Bill Gates is responsible for the whole thing, whatever they're saying. You know, do you think that – I mean, can I ask you? You're someone who's investigated this shit. Do you think these guys have a lot of warning and have years to work on this stuff? Kind of. I, I mean, it's such a, a, a muddy thing. And, all, and also, there's obviously so many branches – of governments, like if, if you're just going to talk about major governments around the world, there's so many branches within that. Like, so in America, there's there's like the government, but that also means the Food and Drug Administration, and that also means their health department, but then there's also commercial interests or whatever. So it, it's hard to kind of just have one paragraph where it's like, um, oh, the government totally is complicit or the government totally isn't complicit. Uh so I, I think generally speaking, like the World Health Organization, for better or worse, probably for better actually. Well, I think for better or worse. No, I, I don't think they I think they're I don't think they're in cahoots with big tobacco. But I do feel like big tobacco tries to figure out a way to get in cahoots and sometimes it might work. And and, and also sometimes it's 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 hard for me to at least for me, maybe someone else to sort of like find smoking guns about certain things so for instance to give you an example of what i am blathering about uh, <laughs> to try to de-blather a bit one of the competitions for these heat sticks is uh vapes so that these things are different to vapes and so philip morris not only is worried about smoking bans they're also worried about vaping filling the hole uh which and they want to fill that hole yeah, you have countries like Japan in which vaping is prohibited, but these heat sticks aren't. And so Philip Morris is owning the space of post cigarettes, if you know what I mean. So vaping wants to be the product post cigarettes, but Philip Morris wants heat sticks to be the product post cigarettes. And it's worked in Japan. And so it's like, how did that work? How did it work that the Japanese government said, you can't have vaping. You can't have vapes, but you can have these heat sticks. So it seems like, you know, maybe Philip Morris was successful in doing the right lobbying behind the scenes to kind of kneecap their competitors in, in vaping. And also in America, I don't know whether it's just incidental and just good fortune for Philip Morris, but uh, vaping's getting a lot of heat in America and uh, might be banned or whatever. But at the same time, heat sticks have kind of like quietly – and with less attention has been approved by the – not approved, that's the wrong word. They've been permitted by the American government's Federal Drug Administration. So then, it, yeah, I can see why a conspiracy theorist or someone who's pro-vaping would go, this makes no sense. Why are you allowing the Philip Morris product through? Why are you permitting that? But you're giving all this heat to vaping. So who knows what's going on behind the scenes there? And And there is – there, there, like in the case of America, there is a thing where you you do say that yet you have people that are in one section of the Federal Drug Administration heavily implying that they wanted to forbid these heat sticks and some other component of the Federal Drug Administration, maybe the ones who are more thinking business minded things, they allowed it. There, there is a truth to what you're saying that there's 
yeah, there's there's definitely some shenanigans going on with uh, Philip Morris tries to work with governments, and that's what they try to do. They they try to do in Australia. The, I think the argument they give to governments is, oh, you've got this new vaping industry, and it's all like anarchic and freewheeling, and you don't actually know what's and all these companies that you, it's hard to monitor them or whatever. Whilst we're the respectable blue chip company that we should be given the reins of being the company in charge of this post-cigarette world of nicotine and and you you should trust us because you'll be able to monitor us, you'll be able to tax us correctly, we'll pay all our taxes and we'll we'll be kind of like a reputable, trusted, blue-chip company that can help in this post-cigarette world. Uh, Is this simply about the new world in the delivery of nicotine, vape versus heat stick, and uh, and obviously cigarettes is sort of falling by the wayside. Is this just a new way of delivering nicotine alongside vaping? And what does it say about consumers who accept what Philip Morris is telling them? I, I promise you, I'm not trying to be a troublemaker by or contrarian by saying this, but my answer to your question is yes and no. So one, one of the little niggles in this whole thing is Philip Morris are in some ways, uh, they've they've got involved in vaping, as in conventional vaping. Uh, in some ways, but my I would say that's just because they're a, a huge behemoth with a lot going on and all these different branches. So you've got like one little branch or one branch is like, oh, let's try to let's invest in Juul, the big one in America, and that's that's a traditional vaping. So Philip Morris aren't totally not in vaping, but having said that. I would say my op-ed is that their main game is the heat stick and because that's tobacco leaf. So vaping doesn't – vapes don't have any tobacco leaf in them and and vaping's quite easy – well, not easy. Yeah, it's, it's relatively easy for anyone to get involved in it, right? Whilst – so Philip Morris want to have their own little marketplace and their own unique uh, selling point – and so, so that's why they're doubling down. And so they see the future as in tobacco, and tobacco does contain nicotine naturally, whilst vaping just contains nicotine without that's been extracted from the tobacco leaf and no tobacco leaf. So that's what I'd say. Philip Morris want the future to be tobacco because they can own that and they've already got all their infrastructure set up for that. And that's also something really hard for like mom and pop businesses and the little guy to kind of get in on, like how you, what you're going to start a heat stick manufacturing plant in your garage in sunshine. Like that's not, you can't do that, but you can start you know, a vape juice thing in your garage in sunshine. And part of that's also, so they have a story to tell their shareholders, Philip Morris. Like that's what I learned when I started getting on their financial calls because I bought shares in Philip Morris because I have no ethics and and but I bought shares so I could then like go on their conference calls at calls as a shareholder and then that, that's when I learned that uh, part of this or a big huge part of this is Philip Morris creating a story that they can give shareholders as to why you should stick with us because we've got this plan for the future and we also have a plan that only we can have because compared to the vaping industries because our our plan is tobacco, tobacco, tobacco. So, yeah, and they really take advantage of the fact that everyone's just, and rightfully so, it's such a confusing issue. They're confused. Like people don't really know a distinction between nicotine and tobacco, for instance, and often people don't really know a distinction between vaping and smoking, and they don't know a distinction between aerosol that doesn't contain tar and aerosol that does contain tar. I, I think vapors who've read my book, like my book's not easy for them because it's, it's sort of like it's not really pro or anti-vaping. It's not about that. It's about Philip Morris leaning into this space and vaping and the world of vaping becoming just one more area that they sort of exploit and weasel around. Um, but, I, I mean, just so uh, people know, like the, the distinction between vaping and this heat stick product like and it's a major distinction is uh, the in a in a cigarette cigarettes contain tobacco leaf T- tobacco leaf generates tar tar is what kills you in a traditional cigarette whilst in a vape it's heating up steam but it doesn't contain any tobacco leaf it's got nicotine it's got propylene glycerol it's got these other things 
that might be dangerous, but it's not tobacco leaf. So you're not, and so it's not generating tar. So therefore, vapors can fairly say that the most deadly thing in a cigarette isn't in a vape, which is tar. And that's true. But these Philip Morris heat sticks, they contain tobacco leaf. So they generate tar. So they've got the thing that's most deadly in a cigarette is also in this new heat stick. So that's where it gets freaking confusing. And Philip Morris take full advantage of the fact that like this is such a confusing thing for anyone to get their head around. If I could just sort of take off my, uh, I mean, I, I'm against cigarettes generally. Okay, um, I, I just think it's a dumb thing. So, I, and I don't like the fact I don't like the public health issue that arises from us. But, but I, I should say that at the outset. But yeah. but if I could just put on my corporate hat for a second, and let's put myself at Philip Morris and think that I got shareholders and I have a, I'm shareholders are paying me and I've got a job to do. I've got to protect the value of the thing that they own. In some respects, what uh, Philip Morris has done is very fucking clever. I mean, like they probably have vertical integration and in that they probably own tobacco suppliers, um, you know, tobacco places which produce tobacco. Um, they um, they have scientists who can um, build one of these heat sticks, you know, they, someone sat down and designed it and they build it and they can pr- manufacture it, as you say. They can, you know, like uh, as a result of that, they can therefore um, build barriers to entry um, in terms of that particular product, they can um, protect that product through patents and copyrights and every other intellectual property mechanism you can probably possibly think of. And in some ways, as opposed to you and I, we have people at Phil Morris who are walking around actually patting themselves on the back, um, saying, wow, how good is that? We got around the, the 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 European thing, and we somehow managed to get into J- to Japan and kept vaping out. And we haven't managed to get in Australia, but we'll keep working on them, and we'll use our lobby power. And, and you know, and you're right; they do walk along to governments and say, "Listen, you don't really know what's going on with this vaping because anybody can do it, and you need to regulate this industry, whether it's vaping, heat sticks, or cigarettes. We're open to being regulated, um, and we'll pay our tax as well, um, and therefore." The government says, "Well, we know a consumer's going to want to do this shit anyway, no matter what. If you don't, if we don't have Philip Morris doing it, they're going to go and buy from some sort of, um, uh, you know, underground uh, cigarette supplier or whatever. It's going to become like underground, like buy marijuana." Um, and uh, the government says, "We'll take the lesser of the two evils, and uh, we'll accept um, what Philip Morris is doing." Um, what do you say about that? Because in some respects, it's sort of clever. I'm sit- I'm sitting in admiration of them. In totally, in all all, in all respects, they're they're geniuses. They're sort of Einstein uh, has been bred with I don't know with Leonardo da Vinci, and they gave birth to the, the Philip Morris board of directors. They're, they're freaking geniuses. There's no there's no denying that, and they're uh, the way that they come up with these ingenious angles and these messing with your head uh trickeries i'm i'm in total awe and uh, you know i like being intellectually stimulated and having to kind of like follow the path of philip morris and me constantly being duped by them where i thought something's going on and it's actually something else um it is amazing they're, they're so brilliant everything they do and what they're really brilliant as and but a language comes part of it is misdirection so where they kind of they lead you this way, so you're sort of not thinking of what you really should be thinking about. So even their entire like their starting point, like we're talking about the heat stick, which is now that you've told me the video scene. See how that's like just looks like a cigarette, a bit shorter. It's got it's tobacco uh, wrapped in paper and it's got a filter at one end or whatever, right? So that's how we've been discussing and I've been describing it, but that's not how they their starting point is to talk about this, which is. This is this thing that's like, it looks like an astronaut's pen. It's really cool. And that's what you slide the heat stick into and that's what heats it up or whatever. And so that this is what they're promoting. And so stra- straight from the very start, they're kind of getting your eye ar- around the, the, the point of the matter, which is this is a cigarette because they're sort of like saying, oh, look at this. It's got a, you know, it heats and it's got a flashy light and this is a new way of like, Heating a cigarette that's not a cigarette, like whatever, and that, like this is how they promote it. So it is the first bit of misdirection because you're thinking about this, and then they just sort of like casually, whilst you're not looking, they sort of go and oh, by the way, um, yeah. So what do you do? You put this tobacco thing in, it, and they sort of like so already from from step one, 
they're trying to get you to not look at the thing that looks exactly like a cigarette. And then, and it just goes all steps of the way. It's misdirection, and which I was duped by all steps of the way. There were things like where I'd handed in, uh, like the first draft or the second draft of my manuscript, and then whilst working on the third draft, I realised, oh my god, I've been tricked one more. There's one more layer to their trickery. So, to give you an example, of what I'm talking about, they bring up this whole thing about how they're trying to unsmoke the world and about how the discharge that's generated from this isn't smoke. It's it's aerosol and because there's not enough granules of, I don't know, there's not, not enough smoke toxicants to make it strictly speaking as well, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like chasing around, like talking to scientists, is this smoke or is this not smoke? Because their, their point is, Philip Morris says, the thing that kills you in a cigarette is the smoke. So if we've come up with something that's not smoke, surely that's a less risky alternative, right? So, the, so of course that makes sense. But then I realise that, Hang on, you're both telling the truth, but there's misdirection in your truth because what kills you in a traditional cigarette, yes, it's the smoke, but more specifically, it's the tar in the smoke. So if this generates tar, who cares if it's coming <laughs> coming in the form of smoke or aerosol or whatever? And it's just realized I just realized like one more misdirection where they're sort of like making me chase smoke down a rabbit hole when really my question the entire book which it didn't occur to me until like I'm writing the third draft is like, no, 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 it's not about smoke. It's about tar. And yes, this contains tar just like a cigarette does and just like a vape doesn't. So yeah, everything's misdirection with them. You're right. And as I'm listening to you, I'm trying to work out, are they evil geniuses? And then I, then my, what, where my mind went to was if, if they are the Joker um, in a Batman movie and if, and if the government Yes. Is Batman there to protect us? And uh, we watch the evil genius try to trick all of Gotham City into something that suits the genius's outcome. And then, of course, we look at Batman to save us all. Yeah. That's the government. But of course, Batman shows us a whole lot of flaws too. And we, the people of Gotham City, we, to some extent, we're open to be manipulated because we actually quite like what the. Um, the, the joke is talking about. We actually quite like what Philip Morris is talking about. We actually think what they're doing is quite clever. And in fact, if I got that blue thing you had there with the the, the thing that heats up the heat stick, it's um, are they are they creating something that's manipulating us to um, to trick us into using their thing, or are they just presenting something to us that we love the trickery of, and therefore we adopt um. it? I mean, is it us who the, is the real problem? I think, like when it comes to traditional cigarettes, you uh, you can say fairly that Jesus Christ, everyone knows, <laughs> everyone knows that they're not good for you. So if you're taking them, you want to take them, and even if you're addicted, there's some complicity in that, self complicity or whatever, right? But because because vaping. Uh, and way, and also way more heat sticks because they're, they're just so brand new and no one's heard of them that even by Philip Morris's rule book of like, well, you should give people choice, it, it's necessary to uh, tell people about this so they can make informed cho- an informed choice. So if they want to smoke a heat stick, uh, uh, that's cool, I guess, but... They should know uh, because no one knows anything about this yet, really. So, but but yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess people do want an easy solution. So maybe maybe if you were addicted to cigarettes and you move on to this new cigarette, which they're claiming isn't a cigarette, like maybe that does provide you with an answer with you out you having to kind of face the facts and go, oh, hang on, I'm still smoking tobacco and nicotine, and also on top of that, just making things about me as always is like, geez, I put way worse things in my – not way worse things. You know, like I was smoking heat sticks doing this and I've taken peyote on TV. Like there's there's definitely like no way I can like wag my finger at anyone <laughs> for doing irresponsible things. But I, I think you, you, the point you made earlier is, is probably a major point for me anyway is that it's about – like let's go, I hate the word transparency, but like like at least give me the information. Don't play, don't fuck with me. Don't try and trick me with yeah. words and games and 
you know, I sort of said, give me the information and I'll make the decision. I mean, we're going to write, by the way, and, and we're talking about massive organisations like Philip Morris, BAT, British American Tobacco. They are massive organisations and they are very good at crisis management and they're, they've they got big balance sheets and they can convince us of lots of things. So they should actually be trying to convince us of the truth. But equally, I mean, we're having the same conversation with governments at the moment. Governments are banning the heat stick here in Australia at the same time they're allowing Pfizer who is a big farmer, to go off and produce something which we are injecting into our bodies. And equally, like the heat stick, it hasn't been tested for very long. Um, you know, hopefully it's for the good of our, of our for our good. Um, but that whole point about choice, us being able to make a choice um, based on having the proper information, and I think that's your point, or a big point that you're making to me anyway, and, and it's a big point of the book, and, and where, where you talk about burning down the English language, they have, I don't want to use the word, yeah, manipulated is not a good word, but like use the English language to deliver to us a different construct and what it is that is actually sending the, uh, you know, the nicotine and or, and or tar into my body. So it's, that's the thing that probably stands out most to me from, this is a great read. That's the thing that's, well, this is not just the read. Um, this is John's, uh, taking holding my hand and taking me down how they did this. You can make the choice whether or not you want to go and buy these heat sticks if you can eventually get access to them in Australia. We'll buy them when you go to Europe one day when we're allowed to go to Europe um, and uh, and make your own decisions. It's up to you. You're, you're not making a moral judgment on it. You're basically saying what's interesting about this is the way they've – the terminology and the way they've got around it. And whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. I mean, it's you, consumers will decide what they're going to decide. None of us are going to change that, none of us. And by the way, the more you put it underground, the more cons a lot of consumers are going to want it just to say that I they fucking got it. Like that, pe a lot of people like that that I know. Um, and I, 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 you're you're not really making a judgment on these organisations here. The, it's more like I limit the judginess to, to the manipulation of language because I feel like that's a – and like the, the the creative bit of me is kind of put out of book. I was like, oh, that's an interesting thing, and like totally hasn't been discussed, or at least not significantly in this way, or whatever. So, and yeah, and also it re it's emotionally true for the readers because they they go, oh yeah, John's obsessed with language. He's obsessed with Scrabble. He uh, he's obsessed with storytelling and words. So it, it really rings emotionally true that. I'm annoyed with how Philip Morris uh, sort of like manipulating words and language and, and in a way and getting away with it. So, that, and that rings way more emotionally true for the reader, I think, than like if that layer wasn't to it. And it was just like, John's angry that people are that they're kind of giving people cancer, which of course, like on some level, that rings true too, because it is true or whatever. But, you, you know, there's a limit to how much a reader is going to kind of want to go on that journey because. Yeah, because I'd just be going, oh, John, you're such a troublemaker and you've done just so many kind of, you know, dangerous things to yourself and whatever. So how much do I really, are you, are whatever, whilst the whole thing of, they, they, they've come into my pond, you know, language and words and storytelling, and they're mucking around with it and they're ruining it for everyone because they're evaporating words of their meaning and uh, words of their, tr of their truth. I, I reckon the reader really goes along with, my fury in that. Something I get out of this anyway is that um, but I've been carrying on about, you know, a, a bill of rights or, you know, like fundamental rights that we all have. And one of the rights that I really never thought about is the right to storytelling. Um, and, you know, all through history, right, going right back to thousands, thousands, thousands of years, all the stories, all the stories that are in the in, in the in the Old Testament, all the stories that are in both in Old Testament, New Testament, all the stories that were you know Greek mythology, you know Roman mythology, they're all written by brilliant storytellers and um and and related by very brilliant storytellers. And the launch of every product is always has got to have a good story associated with it. And the question comes down to: um, Is there a freedom to tell stories? which I don't think you would deny that they have the freedom to tell the story and that, that old saying, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Um, because if you are telling a story, you have to bend the truth a little bit. You have to be prepared to create and, and invent things in their storytelling. And I, actually, in some respects, what Philip Morris has done is quite a brilliant storytelling exercise, not one that I would subscribe to, but nonetheless quite brilliant. And the question then comes down to, 
do they have a freedom to tell that story the way they've told it? And in other words, you manipulate the English language to, um, you know, play around with uh, definitions, etc. And and but equally, um, John Saffron has the right to criticise that story and to to reveal it or investigate it for what it is and have a have his own opinion. And I know I'm taking this way beyond uh, vaping and, uh, and and heat sticks, etc., because it, it, this is actually quite a big philosophical discussion, and it's probably a whole podcast in itself. The whole the right to tell a story and how do we tell a story? I mean, you have your way of telling a story. I have my ways of telling stories, and I can tell you right now, every time I tell a story about something, I always play around with the truth a little bit because I'm trying to make it more interesting. Just like you, when you're entertaining. You, 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 you know, we gild the lily a little bit. It's important. But how much are we allowed to gild the lily? One of the cool things when you put out a book is that you start getting people's interpretations of it and they start saying things that are true that hadn't really occurred to you before. So you, you saying there, it is interesting that they've, my criticism of them is they're telling this story that's, that's bullshit. But the way I've battled that is by, telling a story, you know, like, and I've, I sort of like, I am in a war with them. Like when I'm like, well, I don't want to put it that way, but like I'm, the way I'm countering them is not through science. Even though I do bring up science to tell the story or whatever is like, okay, I'm going to tell a story and I, I hope I get my story sort of beats their story and as a story. And like the fact that this book's funny and the fact that like the book's not like like it, like the fact that it's like the, the book's not whiny and preachy or whatever. The fact that it's a funny book and I'm telling a story. It's got and it's got a beginning, middle, and end, and it's my journey or whatever. It really is like I've I've subconsciously obviously decided that the best way to kind of compete with their story is not with you know what can I bring to I can't bring like being a scientific mind to the thing. I can't bring but I can bring my ability to t- tell a story to try to you know, <laughs> to kind of bash in and somehow throw their story off the rails or whatever. Someone else also said something about how usually John's up to all these stunts and shenanigans in his show and stuff, and that's what it's about. He goes, in this book, it's like Philip Morris are up to all these stunts and these high-octane stunts and everything. So sort of like in this book, it's sort of Philip Morris is playing the usual John Safran role of like trying out all this kind of like really um, slippery kind of uh, crazy stuff. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm left to being the sort of <laughs> the, the viewer, the viewer of, of all this insanity. I really, actually really do think it's a good read. It's, it's a good read, but it's also a good thought, a thought provoker. I um, mean, yeah, that sounds a bit wanky too. Um, I, I don't mean that. I mean, it's just, it's it's a good conversation piece. It, it's actually something that uh, promotes good philosophical conversation about storytelling. I mean, and to me, that's one of the most important things in life: uh, listening to stories, telling stories, um, knowing how to absorb a story, knowing how to uh, contra a story. And in your case, you're contouring a story. It's, I feel like it's John Saffron on <laughs> soapbox in the domain in Sydney, standing there like old days, thirty years ago, standing in the domain with his audience, and over here we've got someone from Philip Morris on their soapbox telling their story and uh, <laughs> you're both shouting at your audience and you're trying to draw people from each other's audience. It's brilliant. It's very good. It's very, very, very clever, very clever. Um, to be honest with you, I think it's a very clever manipulation of, of an audience yourself in that you are, in the old days, we followed you down the dark alleyways. You've actually mm. grabbed hold of my hand and you've, you've actually dragged me along you're taking me i'm not and you've actually taken my choice away a little bit whereas before i chose to follow <laughs> you down various places now you are got grabbing my hand and you're actually taking my choice away so good well <laughs> done good on you john saffron really great to talk to you mate thank you that was really interesting i really appreciate it 